we look at Bible prophecy, particularly the events that are taking place in the Middle East, specifically Israel. We believe that much of what is happening now is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We have many scriptures in the Bible that foretell what the world will be like prior to Christ's return, uh, specifically the rapture of the church, which there are really no signs. Actually, there is nothing that has to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. So today, however, we're going to do something a little bit different as we have the last couple of weeks. Uh, typically, we take a, a couple of headlines and look at what the Bible says about what is taking place and sort of link it, connect the dots, as it were, to Bible prophecy, again, believing it to be the fulfillment of those Bible prophecies. But a while back, the Lord had put on my heart the seven feasts of Israel and how they have prophetic significance as it relates to Christ's coming, his first coming, and the rapture, and then, of course, the second coming. I don't know if any of you have done this, but uh, Leviticus chapter 23 has the seven feasts listed there for Israel. They were appointed feasts of the Lord that were to be proclaimed as sacred assemblies. They were, if you will, holidays or holy days. Uh, by the way, Halloween was not one of them, just so you know. I know that might be a shock to you, but it wasn't. <laughs> these, were, these were festivals or feasts, seven in all, seven the number of completion, that were to be celebrated over a period of seven months. Now, it's interesting because when you look at the prophetic significance of these feasts, you have to understand what they point to. In fact, that's what the word feasts means. It means appointment. What's an appointment? It's an appointment that points to appointment, point, appointment. I'll get back to you on that one, but uh, it's an appointment. See, Israel has an appointment with Jesus. He's coming, and he has an appointment with Israel at his first coming. And that's what these feasts pointed to, that appointment. In the Hebrew, it's the word moad. It happens to be, again, in my native tongue of Arabic, the same word, moad. I have a moad with the doctor. I have an appointment with the doctor. These were signs or appointments that pointed to the destination of the Christ, the Messiah, for Israel and for us as well. The first feast that was given to Israel that we looked at was the feast of the Passover. And this pointed to the crucifixion of the Christ. The Israelites were to put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts in order for the angel of death to pass over them. And the blood was put in the shape of a cross. So because of the blood of a lamb that was shed and put on the doorpost, death would pass over. And so too for us, because of the crucifixion, because of the finished work on the cross, for those of us who are in Christ, who have the blood of Christ on the doorposts of our house, if you will, so too will the angel of death, which is the wage of sin, pass over us. The second feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This is a picture of and points to the burial. This is Christ's body. As we're going to partake today, as we do every first Sunday of the month, the Lord's table, we're going to partake of the bread, which Jesus said is my body. And so the Feast of Unleavened Bread, leaven being a picture of sin, this was bread without leaven as Jesus was the Savior without sin, so too was this feast again pointing to him. The third feast was the feast of the first fruits. And this pointed to the resurrection. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. Beginning of the first resurrection at Christ's resurrection. Then you have the feast, the fourth one, the feast of Pentecost. 
And this was really the birth of the church. This would point to the church age. Now understand that the first four of these seven feasts were fulfilled at Christ's first coming. The last three will be fulfilled at the rapture and subsequently the second coming. We took uh, a lot of time last week, maybe too much time, talking about the rapture, which is the fifth feast, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And again, this points to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. Now, some have argued that to place the church in the fulfillment of the feasts is to almost be guilty of subscribing to replacement theology. Well, what is replacement theology? It's the theology that believes that the church replaces Israel as God's elect. So when you read about the trumpets gathering the elect, all of a sudden now that's the church and not Israel. Let me say to you, you don't have to go to that extent to believe that the Feast of Trumpets points to not just Israel, but also the church and the rapture of the church. Here's why. There are two trumpets that are to be fashioned and made according to numbers. One of those trumpets is for Israel. The other trumpet is for the church that it would point to. These are distinctions between these two trumpets. See, the trumpet that's for Israel is different than the trumpet that's for the church in the scriptures. You have the first trumpet and the last trumpet. You have the trumpet of angels and you have the trumpet of God. The first trumpet is for Israel, the last trumpet for us. The trumpet of angels is for Israel. The trumpet call of God is for us, the church. That's why there was a second signal, a separate signal for that second trumpet given in numbers. So one of the trumpets is to gather Israel for the tribulation. And at the same time, you have the other trumpet, the trumpet call of God, to gather the church for the celebration. Listen, during the seven-year tribulation, we won't be tribulating, we will be celebrating. Oh, does that mean the rapture of the church is before the seven-year tribulation? Yes. Oh, that's just a crutch. Fine, I'll take it. <laughs> Do you want to be here during the seven-year tribulation? Listen. The scripture, <laughs> I didn't think so. If you do, can you see me after the service? I'd like to talk with you. <laughs> the purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. The rapture of the church of Jesus Christ has to take place before the seven-year tribulation. And this feast, this feast of trumpets, pointed to the rapture of the church, gathering the church to meet the Lord in the air, and the other trumpet was to gather Israel back to her land because typically the trumpet would sound the battle cry, the beginning of a war. And it's going to be a war like no other for Israel during the seven years. Now, these last couple of uh, feasts, the sixth feast is the second coming. It's the feast of Yom Kippur. Again, in Arabic, we would say Yom, day, day of atonement, Kippur. What's atonement? The easiest way to remember what atonement is, it's at one meant. See, Jesus made atonement at one meant, reuniting us back to God so that we could, because sin separated us from God, once again be at one with God. I hope you got that because I don't know if I could ever say that again that way. Here's what it meant and here's what it is. It was to be celebrated on one day. And on that one day, the high priest would go into the most holy, the holy of holies where the Shekinah glory of God was. And he would make atonement for Israel's sins. This is where Israel would be at one again with God, now that the sins had been dealt with and atonement had been made for them. So too, our high priest, Jesus Christ, will return with us on that day, the second coming, after the seven-year tribulation, when all of Israel will be saved. Let me say it this way. At the rapture of the church, Jesus Christ comes for us. 
at the second coming, Jesus comes with us, ten thousands by his side. Did you ever wonder who that was that was coming with him by his side? It's you! <laughs> it's me! It's us! It's those of us who are born again of the Spirit of God. Rapture ready. That's who comes with him. So at the rapture, he comes for us. At the second coming, he comes with us. See, we're going to be celebrating, even consummating our marriage to the Lamb. Understand the distinction again here. Israel is the wife of God. The church is the bride of Christ. How cool is this? We're going to be raptured up, and as, as it was the custom in Jewish bridal uh, customs, is the... Uh, the groom would catch the bride, snatch her away in the middle of the, of the night as a thief in the night and take her to his bridal chamber that he had went to prepare a place, usually a room addition, next to his father's house. And they would celebrate and consummate their marriage for seven days. What happens after seven days? Uh, again, a picture of the seven years of tribulation. Again, we're going to be celebrating while the world is tribulating for seven years, consummating our marriage to the Lamb. Now, after the seven years of celebrating our marriage to the Lamb, you know what happens? Big potluck. I mean huge potluck. <laughs> it's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. I can't wait. Good grinds. By the way, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, there will be food in heaven, to which I say, Lord, come quickly. <laughs> it's fat-free, it's calorie-free, there's no high cholesterol, no high blood pressure, no nothing. Okay, I'm glad I just needed to get that off my chest. So, here's this seven-year tribulation on earth and seven-year celebration, and at the end of the seven-year tribulation, at the end of our seven-year celebration, with our bridegroom in the bridal chamber, we come back. And that's what they did in Jewish bridal customs. The bride and the groom would come out after seven days. They would come back out to the wedding uh, party. So too, after the seven years, we're going to come back to earth with the Lord by his side as his bride, and then all of Israel will be saved. That's what Romans, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome said. The whole house of Israel will be saved on the day of atonement. It'll be the final day of atonement for all of Israel. Listen, God is not through with the Jew. And by the way, you don't want him to be through with the Jew. Why do I say that? Because he has a covenant with the Jew and he has a covenant with me and you. If he's going to break a covenant with the Jew then how secure are me and you with the covenant that he has with me and you? Again, I hope you got that. Don't know that I can say it that way again. <laughs> he has a covenant with the Jews. It's the old covenant. It's the Old Testament. So too does he have a covenant with me and you. It's the new covenant. It's the New Testament, the new covenant in Christ. I don't want him being through with the Jew. He's got to play. By the way, that's an Arab telling you that, okay? Listen. He is not through with the Jew. He has a plan for Israel. And on that great and final day when he returns and us with him by his side as his bride, it is the final day of atonement which this feast pointed to when all of Israel is saved. It's really interesting, as one said, the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, represents the affliction and salvation of Israel during the seven-year tribulation, and the day of the Lord, or second coming after the tribulation, it's the day of atonement for Israel, who look upon him whom they have pierced, repent of their sins, and receive Jesus as their Messiah, Zechariah 12.10. And then again, the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome, chapter 11, verses 1 through 6 and 25 through 36, he talks about how it is that Israel, at the end of the seven-year tribulation, will come to a saving knowledge of their true Messiah, but not without first embracing the false Christ, the false Messiah. They're going to realize that halfway through the seven-year tribulation. The last feast is the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Booths. Uh, this is a picture of and points to the millennium and heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. 
It was to be celebrated for seven days and then one day. And the Feast of Tabernacles commemorated God's provision in the wilderness uh, while bringing them into the promised land. Now, what this means to us as the church is that it points to us being brought out of the world or the wilderness into heaven, the promised land. God provided this through Jesus, who, by the way, was probably born on that day in October. You know, by the way, I don't mean to rain on anybody's parade or ruin anybody's Christmas, but Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Sorry. Merry Christmas. The Feast of Tabernacles, or again, the Feast of Booths or Tents, if you will, was commemorated by staying in little thatched houses made out of mainly palm branches. And it was in the month of October, and during this time, it was celebrated. And you can actually, this day, when you go to Israel, you can see these next to high-rise apartment buildings in Israel. They still celebrate this. So the Jews camp in them to remember God's miraculous provision for their forefathers who slept under the stars in the desert for 40 years before bringing them into the promised land. Uh, Just as the Israelites were brought into the promised land after 40 years, so too was Noah, a picture of Israel, the Jews, brought into a new earth, a promised land of sorts, after 40 days and 40 nights of rain. By the way, 40 in the scriptures is the number of judgment. So, you have Enoch before the flood. Enoch was pre-flood, just like the church is pre-tribulation. Enoch, what happened to Enoch? Oh, he walked with God and then was no more. Why? Because God took him. How did God take him? God raptured him before the flood. What? Yeah, Enoch is a picture of the church. And Noah and his family a picture of the Jews. He gets them through the flood, as he will get Israel through the tribulation. But prior to the flood, Enoch was raptured, taken, and Enoch, I submit to you, is a picture of the rapture of the church, just as is Noah a picture of Israel going through the tribulation. Let's bring this in for a landing before we get into our study of the book of Acts this way. You have on the screen a list of all seven feasts, and I want to show you something here that you can connect the dots with Revelation to Leviticus 23. Here's how it goes. You're going to get a crash course in the book of Revelation. Oh, but I thought the book of Revelation was a hard book to understand. Who told you that? I submit to you the devil told you that. Well, why do you say that, Pastor? Because it's the only book in all 66 books of the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart. You know what the book Revelation means? It's the Greek word apokalypsos. It's where we get our word apocalypse. Well, that's why I don't want to read the book of Revelation. (laughs) Because it's so apocalyptic. Yeah, but you know what apokalypsos in Greek means? Unveiling. Revealing. Now, stay with me. Revealing. Revelation? Do you, can you, do you see a pattern here? <laughs> it's a revealing book. It's an unveiling book. It reveals and unveilings that which will take place hereafter. And it's also one of the only books that has a divine outline placed within the, in the book. The Apostle John, banished to the island of Patmos. This is about 95 A.D., This is after they unsuccessfully tried to uh, kill him by throwing him into a cauldron of boiling oil. God uh, apparently didn't, wasn't time for him to go yet. Could you imagine how frustrating that would be? (laughs) You're trying to kill this, uh, you know, this, this little Christ, as they were called, these little Christians. And this guy was, you know, uh, I mean, John, this is the apostle John. This is the, you know, this is the disciple. This is the John of the gospel John. This is the John of the Epistles. He also wrote the Revelation inspired by the Holy Spirit. But he was told to write that which he had seen, that which is now, and that which is to come hereafter. In other words, I want you to write, John, what you are an eyewitness of past. I want you to write what is present, and I want you to write that which is coming in the future. 
That's what the book of Revelation is. So you have this divine outline. So what's chapter one? Chapter one is past. It's all about Jesus Christ, of whom John was an eyewitness of, being crucified, buried, and resurrected. That's the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. Then, after that, I want you to write that which is now, present. So you have chapters two and three, which are present tense. Everything from chapter four, verse one, is future. I hope you're taking notes. You're going to be tested on this uh, Revelation uh, course. So, Chapters 2 and 3. What are chapters 2 and 3? It contains seven letters to seven actual churches in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And these seven letters were written to these seven churches. They were from the Lord. Jesus dictated them to John. John wrote them and actually mailed them. And they were received by the pastors of those churches and read to those churches, starting with the first church, Ephesus, Smyrna. Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea. And it's really interesting. In fact, I may be tempted to do a study on not just the seven feasts, but the seven churches. They are very prophetic in nature. And they are present. And we are in the last of the seven churches, chapter 3, present tense, the church of Laodicea. What do you know about the church of Laodicea? Not a good church. Not a good church. In fact, Jesus isn't even in the church. <laughs> this is the church that he's standing on the door of, on the outside of, and knocking, asking to come in. Why? Because they're the lukewarm church. Of all the seven letters, it's the only church that he says to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. It's not even my church. All the other churches, he said, you know, it's my church, right? Right to the, you know, the angel of the church of Ephesus. The angel is the pastor, which means pastors are angels. <laughs> okay. So, uh, <laughs> no? <laughs> no? Okay. That's all right. <laughs> That's actually what it means. Angel, messenger, pastor. Yeah. Look it up. Uh, don't take my word for it. But so... But it's the only church. Why? It's not his. He's not even in the church anymore. He's on the outside of the church. Why? Because it's a lukewarm church. And interesting, the name would define the church because the name is the nature, and the name was the nature of the church. Leo, Dicea. Leo is where we get laity. Dicea is where we get diocese or decision. In other words, this church, the laity, the people ruled. They made the decisions. Not the Lord, because it's not the Lord's church, and that's why he's on the outside of the church trying to get in. So chapters 2 and 3, present. Everything from chapter 4, verse 1, future. What happens in chapter 4, verse 1? John says, I heard the sound like a trumpet saying, come up hither. The rapture! The rapture! Chapter 4, verse 1, the rapture! You know, it's interesting. Chapters 1 through 3, the church mentioned 19 times. Chapter 4, verse 1, no church. Why? Because it's raptured. <laughs> Chapters 4 and 5, the rapture. Chapters 6 through 19, the seven-year tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. Not the church's trouble. Who's Jacob? Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, as he was renamed. And again, the word church is not once found in chapters 6 through 19, which is all about the tribulation. Why? Because the church isn't in the tribulation. Why? Because the purpose of the tribulation for the salvation of the Jewish nation. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Glory. I need a towel up here. I need to. <laughs> What's chapter 20? The millennium. Keep in mind, before heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, we're going to be on earth for 1,000 years, seated with the Lord on the throne, ruling and reigning with him as his bride for 1,000 years. And the earth is going to be like it was before Adam and Eve sinned. Oh, I wonder what Hawaii is going to look like. <laughs> It's going to be way cool. No sin, no... Well, it'll be an enforced righteousness because understand, those who make it through the tribulation, who accept neither Christ nor the Antichrist or the mark of the beast, will enter into the millennium 
and they'll have their bodies like Adam and Eve. Now, we won't have those. Thank you, Jesus. We won't have our bodies. We'll have our new glorified bodies. But like Adam and Eve, they'll be prolific, and they'll have children and children's children and children. Now, where's Satan during this time? He's been bound by one angel, which I find interesting. It didn't take like a host or a legion. <laughs> I mean, it was just one angel. It's kind of, and he doesn't even have a name. I love that, where it says, you know, this angel, no name, uh, he's a trainee, he's to take the, uh, yeah, no name. No, you'd think it'd be Michael or Gabriel. No, he's nobody. He's just an angel, just an angel. Go get that chain off the wall. Go get him and cast him into the bottomless pit for 1,000 years. He's not there to tempt, but he's released after the 1,000 years. That's the millennium. That's the kingdom age. And then, that's the final battle. Then, He's cast into the lake of fire. And then it's the new heaven and the new earth, and that's chapters 21 and 22. You see that divine outline? Chapter 1, past. Chapter 2 and, two and 3, present. Chapter 4, on, future. 4 and 5, the rapture. 6 through 19, the tribulation. 20, the millennium. 21, 22, the uh, new heavens and the new earth. There, the book of Revelation is not a hard book to understand. It's revealing. It's unveiling. And it unveils what's coming in the future. And it ties in with and even connects the dots with the seven feasts.